Uh, my name's Ivory. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm a Toronto-based singer, actor, model, dancer, uh, <laughs> fire breather, target shooter, uh, and body positive activist. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. I, I just I I had to I had to have Ivory introduce herself because she really is the most Aries who ever Aries in existence and I love that about her and so it makes perfect sense that not only is she a multidisciplinary artist which you know she's wonderfully talented she's an incredible performer but I just love that she actually is a fire breather like she just does that as a hobby also throws <laughs> acts by the way just just cause because it's a Wednesday afternoon and why not so I just think that's fantastic um, our next wonderful incredible incredible performer whom I have just watched on YouTube with my jaw on the ground and been like, um, well, one day I hope when I grow up I get to be you. Um, so I would like the wonderful, incredible performer and life coach, Pearl Noir, to introduce yourself and say a little bit about who you are to our, to our lovely audience. Well, before I even say that, I just want to say thank you so much for thinking of me. Thank you for allowing me to be myself in your presence. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Pearl Noir, and I am the reincarnation and the embodiment of Josephine Baker. I have been called here to honor her work, to honor her journey through the Noir pageant. Hello to my king and the Noir pageant family. And through Healing Through Seduction, where I teach people how to love the entire journey and not just a chapter. Oh, Pearl, that was yeah. beautifully said. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Let me just get my fan right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also have some of, really quickly, I also have some of my House of Noir daughters here and my just regular daughters here. So I just want to say thank you to my family oh. for showing up, so. Oh, that's so lovely. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the next person I, I'm going to ask to introduce themselves with a, uh, anything you want to say for your bio or your introduction is the absolutely ethereal, um, in the embodiment of ethereal, the very lovely Crocodile Lightning. I'm such a huge fan and I just think you're such a wonderful artist and performer and just fantastic human. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Dainty, and thank you for everyone for sharing space together today. It's such a big honor for me to be here and share my experiences with you. I am a burlesque performer, a storyteller, and an artist. And whatever business I've learned, it's through Pearl Noir. So I'm excited to share my spin on it. And whatever art I make, my sole mission is to bring joy to the most mundane moment. And I'm excited to be here, thank you. That's so lovely, Crocodile. That was really wonderful. And last but most certainly not least, I have to introduce one of really a, um, a key proponent, um, if that makes sense, um, a, or I, I should say instigator in the rebirth or renaissance it, for burlesque in Canada, really. Um, the satanic stripper, which I think is one of the best taglines ever in burlesque. Um, the absolutely wonderful Tanya Cheeks. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this. I'm Tanya Cheeks. I'm the founder of Skin Tight Out of Sight, which is North America's longest running burlesque troupe celebrating 20 three years, good God, <laughs> three, 23 years, and um, I'm a producer, performer, and sex work activist. Yeah, I, Tanya Cheeks started Burlesque, was really a huge part of making, when the renaissance and rebirth of Burlesque happened over 20 years ago, Tanya Cheeks was a huge part of that, especially in Canada, and so it's just such a joy to have you with us. Unfortunately, one of our speakers who was going to be with us tonight, Amber Dawn, had something come up, and so she wasn't able to join us, but I really encourage folks to check out Amber Dawn, look her up on social media. She is a sex worker, former sex worker and her activist. She's also an incredible poet, an incredible writer, and she's written 
I, I have only read so far one book, How Poetry Saved My Life. And I've read it in, in one day, in one night. I stayed up with whiskey and just read this entire book. I couldn't stop. She's an incredible storyteller. She's also written Sub Rosa and Sodom Road Exits. So I would really encourage folks to look up her work, get to know her through social media. She's an incredible writer. She's funny as hell and she's a babe. So please get to know her um, in any way you can because I, I really think that she's one of the best people out there who's doing really radical work when it comes to storytelling and femme warriorship. So now we're gonna get into it. No, I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be gentle. I know I saw Pearl like, <laughs> we didn't talk about safe words. No, 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 no. I, I'm going to be gentle. I promise. Um, I have a question that I wanted to ask folks. The first question I wanted to ask folks, and it's okay if you, if you know, I know Tanya just already said it. So if you feel like, you know, lady or dainty, a lady never says her age, you don't have to tell me this part, but I'm wondering how long have you been in this business? Because tonight we're talking about the unusual business of being a showgirl. And as I mentioned earlier, this is our last um, speaker series, our last artist talk in our Push Pull Festival, which has been going on for six months. So I'm incredibly thankful and grateful to every person out there in the internets, into, in the interwebs for showing up virtually and joining us and supporting us and giving us so much love throughout this entire process. Golbu and I and the entire Push Pull team have worked tirelessly to bring this to all of you. And we're we're super overwhelmed and touched that folks keep showing up to us. Um, but yeah, I think that was the first thing I wanted to ask because I know that this is what we're talking about tonight. And I, how long have you been doing this weird, crazy, magical work of being a storyteller in this format, particularly? How long have you been in this business? Anyone can answer? We're all so polite. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I thought Pearl was going to go first. <laughs> I, I, know, darlings. I can go first. So I am boldly, first of all, boldly 41 years old. And I've been in this genre for about 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. That's, yeah. So almost 20 years. And Tanya Cheeks, you said you've been doing this, like you, your troupe has been around for 23 years. Is yeah, that that's right. Yeah. I'm 53 now. And um, I've been involved with sex work since I was 19. So I've been performing before that, like, a, you know, theater art school dropout, stripper, dominatrix, escort, cam model, you name it, I probably did it. <laughs> I love that. Crocodile, how long and I'm you still doing it. <laughs> and you're still doing it. That's right. That's right. Crocodile, how long have you been doing this weird and strange and wonderful work? It's so wonderful. And I spoke to my mom the other day and she showed me as a little boy in a green costume on stage when I was five years old, crying probably because I didn't have a wig on. So from then to now, I think it's been about 35 years wow. doing this work. And I started with a community of trans women who are sex workers in Thailand. So Amazing. it's been a wild run. Well, since you all shared- uh, I didn't get the chance to share as well. Oh my goodness, Ivory, I'm so sorry. Ivory, tell us how long you've been doing this weird and strange work. Uh, I count 20 years uh, that I've been performing professionally. Um, although my first commercial was technically at the tender age of two, uh, I had a bit of a hiatus between then and when I started performing professionally again at uh, 17. And I'll be 36 this Saturday. Yes, your birthday is coming up. Oh, happy early birthday. Thank happy you. Birthday. <laughs> yes. So since folks have shared how long they've been doing this, I'll share as well. I am 41 and uh, I'm a late bloomer. So I, I, I guess I, I would say I've been doing this for the last 20 years. Um, that's when I started 
because that's when I left the church. <laughs> that's when I left home and decided it was time to be an artist and a performer. So I've been doing this for 20 years. And I am the founder of Les Femmes Fatales, Women and Women and Femmes of Color Burlesque Troupe, the first of its kind in Canada. And we have been around for 10 years now. Yeah. You're getting lots of birthday love, Ivory. Just want to let you know that. We're already <laughs> sending you birthday love. I see you guys. You're awesome. I'd be writing in the chat, but I'm actually appearing from my phone today. So if I go to respond to you, you'll see my weird fingers come up on the screen. And then okay. be <laughs> Any questions that come for you, Ivory, I'll make sure to, to send them your way. Oh, so, I can see uh, some that type of response. <laughs> <laughs> so something I'm wondering is, is there a significant or more than one significant moment that has happened over the course of your career as a showgirl and a performer and or a sex worker? Just in general, just a significant just moment? Just in general, anything that you thought like from, and, and, so here's why I asked. So really I started burlesque because I, because Toni Morrison told me to. <laughs> Um, and obviously we're not, we're not tight. Like she's not here with us, but you know, Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison said that if there's a book that you want to write, you have to write the book. And that's really why I started Les Femmes Fatales. And in many ways, that's why I started Burlesque. I was really inspired by Josephine Baker um, and Eartha Kitt and Dorothy Dendridge. And when I started my burlesque troupe, it was because of Toni Morrison, because I wanted a burlesque troupe that looked like me. And in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada, I didn't see a burlesque troupe like me. And so when I think of that question for myself, you know, I think that the significant moment was really daring to dream up a place that looked like black and brown burlesque performers, really off the top of my head, that was me really, the most significant thing that happened over the course of my career in this unusual business as being a, a showgirl was that I, I decided to carve out a space that made sure that it was safe for black and brown and of color and indigenous performers. I also wanted a space that was safe for trans folks and non-binary folks. And I wanted it to make sure that it was very clear that glamor and burlesque and desirability looks like us. And so for me, when I think of that question that I'm, I'm asking you, that's, that's really the most significant um, moment that really happened for me. And it really just started right off at the top and has really been the thread that has run through the entire course of Les Femmes Fatales in terms of the kind of work that I hope that we are doing. And I believe that we are doing when we take up space on stage. And so, yeah, I'm wondering, are there any sort of significant moments, any at all? It could be one, it could be two, it could be several. It could be just a weird backstage moment one time where you, you meet an idol. I would have loved to have met Eartha Kitt. I, I, I just think that would have been amazing or even to have met Josephine Baker. But something that feels like a light bulb moment. I feel like that's something Oprah would say, a light bulb moment. But yeah, I'm going to I'm going to pick on Crocodile actually and <laughs> ask you to share is there are there any particular moments that feel significant for you? Yes. I remember rehearsing in the studio one day and then it just clicked that oh, this is what it feels like to be in my body to embody my own existence. Because after my transition, I have this very perky rack and it's beautiful, but I never know it. It's never mine, even it's part of my body. And then that just clicked for me. And I remember I was at the Vancouver International Burlesque Festival one day performing. And at that moment, I, I knew that this is, what I want to do, this is how I want to tell my stories. And then I started seeing more performers who look like me, the Shanghai Pearl, Calamity Chan, and I see more black and brown performers, AKA Pearl Noor is one of them. And that just the affirmation that I needed. I love that. Thank you for sharing that crocodile. Tanya, are, are there any, any significant moments that come to mind for you? 
Um, I had so many, but the one that sort of stands out is when, um, God, when was it? Uh, maybe 2007 that Skin Tight was invited to perform at Miss Exotic World pageant when it was still in the desert in Hallandale. And I had been like a curator of, of pinup and burlesque um, ephemera since I was pretty much a, a child, I guess. So to meet these living legends like in the flesh was just like gobsmacking. Like, you know, all these people, I just, women that I only had seen like in probably black and white photographs or very like jilted, you know, reels on like, there wasn't even, I don't think there was even YouTube, to be honest at that point, on like something weird videos that I'd only seen them like, you know, and never thought that I would have the opportunity to meet them, let alone share a stage with them. And it was, you know, quite, quite a moment. And um, it was at that moment that I met um, Satan's angel, who is sadly passed, who, uh, you know, took me on as um, a protege and um, because she wanted a Canadian fire queen. So to have her take me under the wing, her wing, and to teach me the fire, like pass on a tradition um, that was hers was quite, you know, pretty like, Highly memorable. That's one of many. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Pearl, is there anything that comes to mind for you in terms of significant moments that, that have mm. happened over the course of your career? I think I mirror everyone. It's just so hard. We're fortunate enough. I feel so fortunate that I'm like, <laughs> there are just so many. Um, but I think I would be remiss not to speak on the most recent and that would be the noir pageant. Um, I decided to create a crown because I saw that I wasn't going to be given one. Not that I was robbed, not because of anything other than it wasn't in alignment with my story. And when I made the announcement, I just couldn't believe it was, now I've been working three years straight on the noir pageant and I had over 30 small businesses, BIPOC business owners who donated over 30 products for these people. I had 15 producers saying, yes, we'll have your king, we'll have your queen, we'll have your princess, we'll have your queen ambassador come headline. We don't know who it is, but we're gonna have them come headline just because you dare to ask. And mm -hmm. then the start of the pandemic happened and all of these people still got on the plane and I will not sit here and deny that that was because of their love for me and their love for our legacy. And mm -hmm. so there are so many, there are so many moments, but I, I feel that I must speak about the most recent and mm -hmm. the people that supported the noir pageant. People are still supporting the noir pageant it's been three years of work straight and it's just <sighs> significant because I grew up being told I wasn't worthy. Right. I know, I know that that is a lie. So that I would have to say that's the most recent one, one of thousands. I think that that's such an incredible moment too, when um, it, it, you realize that you're not alone in, in that way, you know, and that people see you and that they appreciate you and that they, they give this love back. That, that means so much. Thank you for so much for sharing that. Ivory, what about yourself? Anything significant that has happened over the course of your career? Sure. Um, I think, you know, the first big moment for me was the commercial I was in when I was two. And it was because I didn't audition. I grew up in a family that were performers uh, or musicians. My father's a jazz bassist and flautist. My mother was a trained dancer and stride piano player and also blues harpist. Uh, so there was jazz jams in my house every Saturday growing up. I grew up singing, I grew up performing, I grew up creating pageants and musicals and whatnot. Uh, but it was literally that day, uh, my dad was in advertising because have a day job if you're going to be an artist, right? That's what they told him. Uh, and the kid that day had come down with croup and he called home and asked my mother, uh, 
is it the good bee or the bad bee? My whole family calls me bee. And my mother says, it's the good bee today. Why? Because <laughs> I was a handful. And he goes, great, get her ready. I'm coming to pick her up. And he comes and he picks me up. And I go and I do this commercial for Johnson Johnson's. And I remember being given my own change room. Like, this is two. I, the fact that I actually have these memories is weird, but I do. And I remember having this plush um, robe and I got to come out and they played my favorite song, which at that point was Michael Jackson's Bad. <laughs> and I came out onto set, <laughs> all sassily. And then I chased a lamb around in my underwear for the next two hours <laughs> because it was for Johnson and Johnson's baby oil. And, you know, the tagline was, your little lamb needs a little help. And I <laughs> ran around after this lamb. <laughs> you couldn't get me off stage after that point um it changed everything I don't know what would have happened if that hadn't been the trajectory I've mm -hmm. been performing ever since I like to say I started professionally at 17 but I was performing before that like I, I performed as much as I could as long as I could because for me um there was no better place than the stage uh mm -hmm. I just wanted a place to be seen and heard and I have consistently fought back um, against people who told me I didn't deserve to be there by taking up more space, really. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And amen to that. I really, I really love that so much. I think that like, in terms of taking up space and, and being belonging in places where, where we're told we're not supposed to be, one of the things I always say is we, we come from impossible peoples. I really believe that. I feel that uh, black and brown women and femmes, indigenous femmes, trans women, and I maybe this isn't my place to say, but I, I hate the term trans women because it, it should just be women, like trans women are women. So it should just be that. Um, but sometimes you have to say that. I, I just think that we we are impossible people. I think we come from impossible peoples. I think that resilience and survivorship and magic is literally woven in our DNA. And so we show up, we show up whether they want us there or not. We show up in, in places and spaces where we are not supposed to be. And there's something to me that is miraculous about that. Audre Lorde says that we were never meant to survive. And so for me, anytime I see a black woman, a woman of color on a stage or on a platform, it, my heart just does a, you know, a little flutter because we're not supposed to be there really. Those spaces are not created for us. And in the scope of whiteness, that also extends to you, Tanya, in terms of you're not performing a good womanness, you know? I think that Burlesque's has a huge history of that in terms of anybody who performs this kind of work is operating outside the norm, right? You're operating outside of the norm of what is good in terms of being a good woman, in terms of proper, being proper, propriety. And the fact that we dare to bear our skin and show our bodies and make a profit off of that is scandalous. And, I, and even in the age of Pornhub today, I think it's still scandalous. I think it's still quite shocking for a woman to make any kind of money off of her own body and her sexuality. And so I just think that it's quite revolutionary that we show up, that we're here and we exist in these spaces. I grew up in the church. My, my daddy's a pastor. I grew up, my, my denomination is Hebrew Pentecostal. And so I like to say that I was raised Jew dot, 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 ish, um, just a little bit outside of what's considered regular Jewishness. And I also grew up in a small white town. And so there, for my entire life, I've always felt this feeling of being slightly uh, askew or slightly out of step, right? To be one of four black families in a small white town, to grow up in the church, to not be the right kind of Jewish person, to, to be the a black woman who decides that I'm going to perform sensuality and sexuality on a stage. It's like you're constantly breaking all of these rules. And one of the things I think about that is that no one really tells us these rules. We're just supposed to know them, right? I, I want to know what does it mean to be a showgirl? And so what does it mean to be a rule breaker? And again, Tanya Cheeks, I would, I will ask you first, because again, I think that 
within the realm of white womanness and whiteness, you're still breaking rules. You're tattooed, you're small, you're not a small woman. You're trying to participate in diet culture and make your body small. You are a sex worker and you're not, you're not hiding that. There's no shame around, nope, this is what I do. You're not trying to apologize for it. Um, your tagline is a satanic stripper. Like you're performing badness and being a dangerous woman or a dangerous femme in a particular way. And so I'll, I'll tap your shoulder virtually first. What does it mean to be a rule breaker slash showgirl? What does, what does that mean for you? Well, I was brought up unconventionally. Um, my parents are outsiders. They're like, we're nomadic hippies. So I didn't really have a conventional upbringing to begin with. Um, but, uh, I just sort of like, you know, I was interested in sex work for, as a child, even like, <laughs> um, I this is just, you know, gravitated towards those like archetypes of feminine evil. <laughs> like that was what appealed to me as a child. Um, I was always, you know, told I was, you know, too much all the time, right, from relatives and whatnot. And I just got kind of tired of it. And, you know, um, it grew, you know, grew through the punk scene or whatever. And, um, you know, as a, as a conventional stripper, like club stripper, I was, even when I was probably what's considered smaller, like than I am now, like, you know, size 12 or whatever, I was still like considered like big and, you know, back then tattoos weren't really acceptable, but I just, you know, like then I broke away from that and became a professional dominatrix and then later got into burlesque. But, um, then like the neo burlesque movement was kind of narrow for my parameters when it started like you know we started doing sort of traditional you know pin up sort of rockabilly thing but i always found that kind of limiting for what i wanted to do like i wanted to like you know explore like i said the feminine archetypes of bad girls whatever on stage and um you know, really kind of push the audience. Like I was talking about this the other day about when Skin Tight started, this is like internet, it was around, but like, it wasn't like, you know, the, what we went, we didn't use it the same way as we, you know, do today. And when we, early bookings for Skin Tight out of sight, like I was doing the bookings, you know, on the phone, you know, for whatever corporate events and, you know, I'd send them pictures or I had a, you know even a portfolio with other performers and I go they'd go like I want this one this one this one but I don't want the fat one I don't want her and then not knowing that they were talking to me on the phone and I'm right. like well you know she's pretty good like maybe you should consider like having her you know and I'd have to like sell myself like you know to these people that didn't realize that they were talking to said fat performer <laughs> and they'd be like okay fine throw her in like, you know, like I was like, I don't know, a consolation prize for their event. So there was a lot of sort of discrimination because I always say that if you're um, plus size or bigger, you appear more naked to your audience than someone that's conventional size. That much flesh mm. in, on stage becomes actually a political thing. Right. Like it just, it kind of makes people nervous and throw in sort of like sort of the archetypes of sort of demonic monster archetypes and things like that that I like, you're really going to possibly upset people at first. But my whole goal is to like, you know, fuck it, fuck it, mm -hmm. you will like it. In the end, you will like it. And that, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be doing this for this long if, you know, it, I, I failed at that sort of attempt. And that's the same thing that's happened with me in sex work, but I actually find sex work is a little bit not it happens but it's a little bit less um narrow than like the public stage like the public stage is a little because you're a bit more out there sex work tends to be a little bit behind closed doors even though i am very upfront about what i do but when you're putting yourself out there you're you are definitely more naked than naked and and I, i'm glad to see that there's more opportunities for more diversity you know on the stage like when i started skin tight the site we wanted you know we we had um, people of color, we had like, you know, non-binary um, and all kinds of, you know, incorporated all kinds of different types. You know, we had like a, um, a male performer, like a boy less when that wasn't too much of a thing. There was only a handful. So I just always wanted to have an, you know, all inclusive um, stage, but you know, it's still, I mean, it wouldn't be fun if you weren't like provocative, you know, 
pushing people's buttons. I, I don't think I would be still doing it if it wasn't a little bit dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the hashtags I used when I was doing my promo. I, I've learned Instagram lessons from Ivory, actually, because I'm, 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 I'm so when I was doing my hashtags, I, I, I just did dangerous women or dangerous femmes, because I think that's part of what being a showgirl and being a rule breaking woman is about. Pearl Noir, what are your thoughts to that question? What does it mean to be a rule, a rule breaking woman? What does it mean to be a showgirl for you? Such a sacred question. So I just wanna honor that. I feel that, I feel that. Every time you touch your heart, I, I, I wanna touch my heart, so I feel that. Yeah. When I think about it, from what I've learned, oftentimes being the only black showgirl in the room for many years, I've made a lot of unknown, silent, powerful sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And it all started when I was a child. I grew up in the South. I was called one of those fast tail gals, even though boys didn't even like me. I was always told I was ugly, but I always had this body mm -hmm. um, and I had what they call a switch. And the wrong type of men, predators have always been drawn to me. And this is still the case for me as a 41 year old. I always mm -hmm. get the inappropriate dad, the inappropriate boyfriend kind of um, interactions. Mm -hmm. um, but I also get a lot of people who come to me for erotic massages, for transformative burlesque as a, as a way to, to heal themselves. So what I would say is that uh, when I think of what it means to be a sex worker, what it means to be a showgirl, it is an invitation from the divine. Mm -hmm. It is pure divinity. And unfortunately, that also means a life of pain and struggle and being misunderstood. Divine energy has never been understood. And as my mentor, Goddess Amina, likes to say, God is the orgasm. So everything that is divine starts in pleasure. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more pleasing to us than having the experience of uninhibited energy, which is divine. So that is what we provide as mm -hmm. showgirls and sex workers, in my very humble opinion. Absolutely. And I feel like I have a feeling I'm going to be saying amen more than once tonight and hallelujah. Honestly, I suddenly had a feeling or sense of being in stripper church as which is something that when when we are in live performance, that's one of the things we the ways that we describe sinful Sundays, which is curated by Dolly Berlin, who is an indigenous burlesque performer and producer. And the sinful Sundays is called stripper church, we call it. Um, and I feel that I feel everything you just said in my in my heart, in my spirit, Pearl. Thank you so much for that. I I infuse a lot of spirituality in the work I do for Les Femmes Fatales and in my other work as a storyteller as well. And I, I've always felt that these wild untamed women were, were divine, that they were still holy. I, I've always believed that Lilith from, from the Bible was just as divine and just as holy as Eve, right? And that there wasn't anything shameful about our sexuality or, want, or, or wanting to own our own power. So I, I appreciate so much everything you just said that means the world to me. My, my tagline um, as a burlesque performer is church lady gone bad because it was it was the only way to sum up the entire story of my life in one sentence and I, I MC our shows and so when I get up on stage sometimes it, you know I do a little preaching do a little preaching Ivory what are your thoughts as well on what does it mean to be a rule-breaking woman what does it mean to be a show girl uh, for me um, I think that to be a rule breaking woman and to be a showgirl in a body that's unconventional, uh, be it because I'm in a racialized body, because I'm in a body that's also white passing. So people sometimes feel 
Uh, you know, they have the license to say things around me that they otherwise wouldn't, <laughs> uh, to be in a plus size body. Um, it's revolutionary every single time I take the stage. Um, for a long time as a performer, I really wow. believed when I wasn't offered a seat in the, at the table, I believed in bringing my own chair. And mm -hmm. as my story evolved and as my career evolved, I believed in creating my own table, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And um, I have always led uh, with uh, an unabashed confidence that if I am here, I deserve to be here and I will show you why. <laughs> And I also really believe in bringing all of the misfits like myself with me. I think that we're united because of our differences and we have an onus and a duty as artists and as performers to make way for the people around us, the people behind us and the people running with us uh, so that they have a chance too. I have always believed in not just opening doors but in kicking them down so that we can take up the space that we have been denied time and time again. And I think that being a revolutionary, uh, you know, doesn't always necessarily have to look like, um, you know, the Che Guevara's of the world and whatnot. I think that just being comfortable in your own skin and showing people how to do the same is also a revolutionary act. Doing the very things that they tell you not to is revolutionary uh, and reminding people um, that we are united through our differences mm -hmm. is, is a revolutionary act and is, is our job as you know, performers, as artists, as storytellers, uh, and as unique individuals taking up space in a world that wants to silence us. Absolutely. And I, I will most definitely say amen to that. I, I truly, truly appreciate it. I, again, I think that, you know, when Pearl, Pearl Noir had just said, I, we were all there, we, we all witnessed it, um, that the divine is always misunderstood. I really felt in my bones. And I, I would add to that to say, I, I really believe that the divine is always misunderstood, most particularly when it's in a feminized body. I think that there's something to be said about being a difficult woman, right? And so, you know, there, there are women who are holy and women who are saints too, but I, I don't remember hearing about them when I was growing up. Like I really had to seek those women out. Um, I, I grew up knowing about holy men and divine men, but not so much radical and divine women. And so bless you, bless you so much for saying that, uh, Pearl, I truly appreciate it. Crocodile, what, what are your thoughts to that? What do you, what do you want to share with us? Uh, I'm resonating with a lot of things that everyone is sharing. And for me, it's not like I'm, I'm waking up this morning, setting an intention to break rules. Mm. But the rules that exist don't really fit with who I am or how I am. I'm walking between the lines of gender. I'm walking between the lines of countries as an immigrant. So I cannot simply just making myself small just to fit any molds, mm -hmm. just to exist, not even thriving, just to exist. And when I truly believe in myself, not as someone who's superior, just believing in my worth, period. Mm -hmm. Then I need to stand in the light of my own truth and be that light that lights the path for me. Absolutely. And being yeah. the show girl, it's just an invitation that I can come back home to my worth and to my divinity. And I'm extending mm -hmm. that invitation to the audience to have that Absolutely. time. You know, when when I think about the overlap or at least the intersection of sex work it, with showgirl and being a showgirl or show performer, they they exist side by side, I, I believe. And I think that there again, there is something really quite holy about radical horrors or holy horrors, right? In a different time and in a different place, I think women like us would have been worshipped. And I want to add to or question something that Ivory had just said, because I think it was so amazing, it gave me goosebumps, is it's really important that we recognize that 
each of our resistance and each of our what makes you a revolutionary it doesn't have to look like anyone else like you know what i mean like my revolution the revolutionary acts that i'm here to do don't have to look like martin luther king jr or rosa parks or che Guevara. you know what i mean like they don't have to look like other people my resist my resistance and my revolution only has to look like me and by doing that I might not, I might just not only save my own life, but save someone else, right? And so I think it's so important to, to, to recognize that, that revolutionary living is, is, is a multiplicity of things. It's so many things, right? And part of it is just as Crocodile just said, Part of it is just our existence, right? It's just us being here because that by itself is a defiant act. And so I'm, I'm so incredibly touched by that. Um, I want to ask, how do you make a business out of this? How do, how, do, how do we do that, right? Like, is there a rule book on how to do this? Are we, you know, like, and how to do this and, and how to make any kind of a living, pay a phone bill or buy groceries. Cause I felt like I learned like haphazardly. I was like, oh, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't have any mentors really. And so I really learned through stumble and fumble. And that's how I figured out how to be a showgirl, much less how to be a working artist in any capacity was I, you know, I sort of failed up in a way, right? But I mean, I mean if, if white straight men are allowed to fail up, why can't I? And so I really learned through trial, trial and error. And so I'm wondering, how did any of you sort of learn that? Did you have mentors? Did you have an idea that there is a way to do this and make some kind of money off of this? Did someone sort of show you the way? Anyone feel free to, to jump in and, and answer that. I'm, I'm really curious. I think I learned early on uh, that if they don't hire you, make the work. If they don't, if they don't cast you in the, you know, the theater production you're going for, or they don't hire you for the dance production or whatnot, make the work, produce shows, put the work out there. And once I got tired of producing, because that burnout is quick, <laughs> uh, I learned that the whole idea of being a jack of all trades, master of none, is not always a bad thing. Um, no, it's the more you diversify, yeah. the more you have in your toolkit, the more um, irons you can have in the fire. And mm -hmm. that has always worked for me as a businesswoman, because if one industry is, uh, you know, lagging, whether it's film and TV, uh, then I'm off singing. And if I'm bored of that, uh, then I'm off dancing. And if I'm bored of that, I'm producing. And if I'm bored of that, I'm modeling. And if I'm bored of that, I learn how to fire breathe. And if I'm yeah. bored of that, we pick up a new one, we master it, we get hired for it, and, and we learn how to do it well. And that way, uh, you know, you diversify your income streams mm. and you get yourself the most chance to succeed. And it's funny because when I was doing that early in my career, I had a lot of um, professors trying to mentor me and tell me, you know, you can't do all of these things. Just pick one or two, or at the most be a triple threat. And I was like, but I do it all. I want to do it all. And yeah. I think the only thing regrets I have in my career are when I shortchanged myself and stopped working on a particular avenue of art because I was told don't pursue it all because you can't give it your all equally. Right. And, and honestly, the times that I have started flourishing in my career is when I have had all of the different avenues firing, um, you know, in step and in time. And, and I can return to each of them as I put them down as if they're brand new again, because I've had a chance to miss them. I was working on this theater project, so I had to put down those ones. And now when I come back to it, I come back to it with a vengeance because I missed it and it was there and I needed it. And so I'm over here creating. And, and I think that that has been, um, you know, really the crux of my work as an artist personally. I, I absolutely respect and love that, Ivory, and thank you for sharing that. I, it took me a really long time to appreciate my own path. I think because I'm largely self-taught, and again, I'm a late bloomer. I started later than other people. Um, 
I, I didn't have a mentor. I, again, I really like through trial and error learned how, how it, what it meant to be a storyteller and a working artist. I really did fumble and stumble my way forwards. It took me a long time to really appreciate the glory of that journey, right? Because I was constantly comparing that I wasn't classically trained or I don't have anybody to tell me what the right way is. And at some point something switched and I realized or several things happened to make that switch. Which, but it's one of those moments where the divine is like, you're not looking at the full picture. You know, you're not seeing the, the, the entire whole, right? And when I had those moments sort of come together, I could recognize that if I don't know what the rules are, then I can make up my own rules, right? If I don't know that it's supposed to be this way, then it doesn't matter which way I do it. I could do it my way. No one's going to mm -hmm. tell, you know what I mean? And I started to appreciate the, 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 the glory again of my own unique path. You know, I, I'm an actor as well, and I'm also a playwright and a producer. And I, I, I've been in a play or, or have been in a situation in theater where, you know, the lights are on, we're nervous, we're scared. It doesn't matter how long you're doing rehearsal. All of a sudden, your, your brain, you can't remember your own freaking name. You lost everything. And you're in the scene with the other actor and the, a line gets dropped. And I've seen like absolute terror in the other actor's eyes because they've lost the thread. They've lost the script because one line of dialogue is gone. Right. And so now they don't know what their character would say. And I realized that all those years of being in cabaret, all those years of having to perform in front of mostly white audiences or drunk audiences or being, as Pearl Noir had said multiple times, being the only black girl in the green room and then on stage, I knew how to improvise. I knew how to, the show had to go on. The character, I, I would have had an understanding of that character and knew how to tell the story, if the, whether the line got dropped or not. And I started, so I started to appreciate the unconventionality of what it meant to follow your own path, that your, your success and your glory and your, how you make money doesn't have to look like anybody else, right? And that it doesn't, um, the idea of being legitimate and being a real artist is, 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 is nonsense and it isn't a truth and it doesn't have to be my truth. But I definitely spent a good, mo a good many years you know, playing the comparison game and looking at other people, going on Instagram, looking at people and thinking, well, they must be doing it better than me. They must be doing it right. And I really remember wondering, well, how do they make money? How are they doing this? How are they figuring out what the, what the hustle is? And I, I will, I'm going to tap your virtual shoulder, uh, Pearl, and ask, how did you learn these things? How did you learn what your worth was and, and how to make any kind of money or sustainability doing this unconventional job? It was a um, very, very long journey. Um, and somehow there was a switch that went off that helped me understand um, and I think it's because um, one of my mentors was Dita Von Tees, still is Dita Von Tees. And when I was touring with her, I just decided that I was going to watch everything that she did and not only just watch what she did on stage, but I would go to the theater at around 2 p.m. when we didn't need to be there until 6 p.m. because I wanted to see what her manager was doing. I wanted right. to see what was going on behind the scenes and one of the things I've tried to teach all of my burlesque children and anyone else who will listen to me is that you cannot abandon the business in show business. It is called show business. And a lot of people really focus on the show element, which is totally fine. But if you're actually talking about, um, you know, generating income and actually securing a legacy that is actually fulfilling, then you have to really ask yourself what you're doing behind scenes because 1000 likes feels great. A standing ovation feels amazing, but did your bank account give you a standing ovation today? <laughs> did your bank account give you? <laughs> what, about, what, about your, what about your self -esteem? Did your bank? You know, what, what about mm. your self-esteem? Because what it is, is it starts with your self-love journey. And I say this and people don't want to believe that, but when you are really focusing on your self-love journey, you will fall in love with the power of no. 
You all need to embrace the power of no and understand that no is not an ending. It's an opportunity for you to inspire yourself. Also, the way you're going to make money is focusing on what inspires you. Like inspiration is the only thing they haven't taxed yet. And and we're in an era where everything is free. There is inspiration everywhere. So you Mm. really have to focus on what's going on behind the scenes. And in order to do that, you have to actively say that I'm going to work on loving myself because when you really love yourself, you won't take that $50 gig that you invested $400 for because you you don't need to be filled up by someone else validating you. That's that's where it really is going to start. And so a lot of people, unfortunately, who are performers, especially in burlesque, unfortunately, they're not ready to release the the ego and entitlement they have to a yes. Mm. And, and, and they're not willing to honor the opportunities that are presented to them when they're presented to them because they're too busy looking at what someone else has. This has happened to me so many times with a lot of my children. They're like, but you gave this person that. And it's like, right, but I why are you focusing on this opportunity? So it's, it's that it's, it's focusing on your self-love, actually mm-hmm. learning about the business, learning about things like financial liter- literacy and security, mm-hmm. and actually taking some marketing classes that are free right now. And if you do have the luxury to have anyone in your life who kind of mimics the success you want to attain, I, mm-hmm. I, I encourage you to ask them to be your mentor or if they present that to you to actually follow up on that. But yes. if you don't have that, there are a lot of resources and definitely taking a free business class, definitely taking free marketing classes and, and focusing on your self-love journey. And then once you do that, you won't be afraid to not mm-hmm. be seen. So a lot of times everyone's burning themselves out too because they're, they're like, I have to be seen, I have to be seen. And so for me, I focus also on multiple streams of income. Right. So what I decided to do, I said, hey, um, I'm in New York City. Now my white counterparts can be seen at these bars and still get offered to headline. I saw that I wasn't because a producer told me straight up, well, why am I going to pay you $1,500 when I saw you in New York at this pub? I said, okay, so let's focus on another stream of income. Let's work on consulting people. Let's do um, burlesque classes online. That's when I started my online burlesque academy. Um, This was like 2014. And so when you focus on having another multiple stream of income, then you can Mm -hmm. say yes when you really want to say yes. And that's why I was able to focus on just headlining. I decided Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a headliner. That means I will only be seeing the way a headliner should be seen in, in headliner venues and opportunities. Mm-hmm. I, so I, I, I hope that makes sense, but I, you will not make any money until you focus on that self-love. In my opinion, again, these are just my opinions. And if it doesn't resonate with you, this is not an attack. We have so many beautiful panelists here. So I'm sure you'll get inspired from someone if you're not inspired by me, but you won't make money because you'll be afraid to make money until yeah, you focus absolutely. on okay. that self-love and healing yourself from the trauma, especially if you're a person of color, you've been mm-hmm. taught that you're not supposed to have wealth. You've been taught that that's being egotistical. You've been taught to be humble. And that humbleness is an illusion. Um, and this is, this is by design. So that's why I say it goes back, in my opinion, to, to healing, actively loving yourself consciously. Absolutely. I think I really believe that we have to love ourselves free and love ourselves into our wholeness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a lot of what you said really resonated in terms of releasing scarcity and recognizing yeah. our own worth, knowing that it's okay to ask for what we want. Yeah. Um, I had a conversation recently with Raven Wings, who's a multidisciplinary artist and activist. And one of the things we had talked about is why is it that black people, only certain people, I would say, black people, marginalized folks um, are asked to keep it real. Why are we the ones that are asked to keep it real? Not no one else, right? And, and what does and, that mean? And humble, I mean, and, and be humble, yeah. and to be and humble. Just be humble. <laughs> yeah, 
right? And, and I think that that is a way to make sure that we know our place. It's a yes. way to make sure that we don't get too rich, right? Yeah. Even the fact that Beyonce had to put in her song that she still puts, she's got so hot sauce in her bag. It's like, you don't have to tell me that you're still country. You don't have to explain your life to me. Even with that lyric, I understood that she was trying to let us know that she was still one of us, or she was still real. It's like, well, what if she isn't? What if she isn't? Yeah. What if she's a rich black lady? And that's that's her truth. Yeah. Crocodile, is there anything that you want to? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pearl. Oh no, let's get to my daughter, Crocodile Lightning, the Queen Ambassador for the Noir Pageant. Let's go. Get into it. Oh, Pearl. So a lot of my business knowledge is coming from Pearl, and she is shown me by example and by lectures, by heart-to-heart -heart conversations that this is a business, so treat it like one. And my spin on it is it's the most anti-capitalist thing I can do, which is make it about relationship. I, I feel like when I go to a gig, I perform for about 100 people including the bouncer, people who seat the table, and the bartenders. And I cultivate relationships intentionally with each person and audience included. And that fills my heart and that aligns with my goal. So even though there are 1,000 marketing strategies, I still have to come from a place of self-love and pick the strategy that aligns with me which is relationship. And then I bring that to the gig, perform with integrity, and then I just keep getting booked. And that's how I make money. And at one point I got lost in the hustle culture a little bit that, oh my goodness, I need to be seen, book me, book me, when the bookings were already coming. I just needed to stop and appreciate that. And I recalibrate my balance again that it's not about stacking gigs but it has to fulfill me and my bank account too thank you so much for sharing that crocodile i i really appreciate it and i think that uh, perhaps some folks might be surprised to hear the word self-love in a conversation around burlesque um, and, and I only say that because I think that certain words have been co-opted by particular persons and communities and pockets of the Instagram or the internet world. And so words like self-love or self-care or loving yourself now belong to the wellness community, <laughs> right? And, and again, and that wellness community and that wellness um, industry are, are generally speaking uh, very slim bodied white women who are now telling you how to love yourself. And so I, I do think that it's really important that in this conversation of black women and large body tattooed white women um, and a gorgeous, incredible Asian woman that we talking about self-love and how radical and necessary it is that it's a part of the work that we do because our bodies have value, right? Our bodies have value. The work that we, we do is valuable and actually necessary. And I, because I do believe it's necessary, I want to tap Tanya Cheek's shoulder virtually because someone had made a joke about what we're doing to, to get through this, this, this time, this, um, you know, during our, our least favorite P word, this period of time. Uh, the pandemic, some folks have made the joke around, well, of course, everybody's binge watching Netflix and Hulu and all the other things. Of course we are, right? Suddenly books are more interesting now. People are going to the library and reading things online. And of course, sex work has become even more necessary. And so I think it's quite interesting that all of us who, I think it was Tanya who had talked about being an outsider, right? Or being outcast. And then you realize the value of artists 
which we, we were always valuable, but a particular time like this happens where the world is put on pause and suddenly people remember that artists and outsider folks are valuable and are important because all we've been doing is ordering food and having you know people who have to work through a pandemic get on their bike and Uber Eats and bring food to us and watch TV and be taken care of or soothed by artists and performers and entertainers and sex workers, right? Who have always been here, have continually always been here through good economy, through bad economy, always been here, right? And so someone had said, or several someone's have said, because I, I, I read, I, I like to look at what people are saying on the internet as much as I can without it being incredibly damaging to my mental health, that during a time like this, of course, the only people who are going to be doing well are the sex workers and the LCBO, like whoever sit, sells alcoholic drinks. And I want to ask Tanya her opinion on that, because earlier during the pandemic, there was a bit of a scandal when that actress, who we don't need to say her name, she's not that important, but she got a fans only site and, and co-opted some that sex workers do. All of a sudden, it was suddenly cool to pose in your lingerie uh, just just because because she wasn't acting in a movie or on a television show for whatever reason or whatever her whim was, whatever her reason was, it was suddenly okay. And I want to talk about what does that look like? Like, do you feel any sense of rage really when something you've been doing your whole life ends up being co-opted? Uh, someone just added in the, our administrative assistant, Belle, just put, she was doing research, doing research, which is why that actress had gotten a fans only site. But I think that we need to talk about it because all of a sudden the fallout from that was that the, the rules, at least my understanding is that the rules got far stricter, tighter, even with Instagram, you, you couldn't post particular uh, overtly sexual content anymore. They were cracking down. There was a huge fallout from that. And we are the ones that suffered, particularly sex workers are the ones that had to clean up our act or change how we, how we essentially make a living, how we portray ourselves. And so I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, do you feel any kind of anger when it feels in a way as though your life is being invalidated or at least being appropriated by someone who has far more privilege really and far more access well, you have to remember the internet is forever. So like if you're going to go on a like a fans only type site, remember that that stuff could, you know, could live on when you are just trying to do something because you're you're either bored or you have to in a pandemic. Like that's the thing. Um I mean there is and to so in some ways it becomes more acceptable, but in the other on the other hand, now we just sort of feel like at any time all our content's going to be like wiped out, mm -hmm. you know? So now there's this, and I feel like there's a really like heavy kind of censorship going on right now um, mm -hmm. with like, it only, you know, I'm of that age where I lived through the censorship, like the PMRC, like censorship in the, um, you know, during the eighties. And I just feel like some of that stuff is kind of like happening again, like mm -hmm. the satan satanic panic, you know, it's happening again. Like look at, um, you know, with um, say my name and, you know, this, in the fear of having little NASA's like stuff being taken down. I, I feel like yeah. we're living in a bit of a panic, a panic in a pandemic, you know? Um, right. And it's like, it's fine and dandy if you have the means to, you know, do your work online. But like, there's a lot of people that are doing survivalist se sex work right now. They don't have any other, you know, choice or they don't even have the luxury of having internet and I always like say there's a thing called the hoarchy and I really try to discourage people about saying that that type of sex work is okay but this kind is not like uh, it's okay to be doing like stuff you know by yourself in your home but it's not mm -hmm. okay to be doing it on the street and I really like you know that part of my personal agenda is to eradicate that type of hierarchy beliefs so like um it's a little bit of both like is it more acceptable i'm not really sure and it is like you know i've been doing cam work. cam work has never been my favorite thing i've been doing it on and off since its infancy like but you know now because of i can't work i'm doing it and i don't you know it's like everyone has a an account and 
I don't know. <laughs> I got mixed feelings about it, but it's, you know, this is probably the future. Like, I don't think we're ever going to go away from these like online elements, like Zoom shows and online shows. I don't think those are going anywhere. So we do have to make, you know, space for that and maybe look into it a little bit like harder, but um, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And yeah. you, know, um, you, you just have to be your own brand. Like just don't try to be somebody else. Just know right. your brand and be that and work in that. And that's the way you're going to make money. If you're trying to be someone else or, it's going to pick up tips and things for sure. But just remember that you're your own brand. Don't let someone try to dissuade you to be something else and, and do what you feel comfortable doing and don't feel pressure. I know that with like fans only there's, and I've run into this myself and that some of my, my friends, it's like, well, well, I did this DP or whatever the hell. And where do I go? Where does it go? Like, you know, from there, like, so just stick with in when what you want to do and what you feel comfortable with and, you know, and, and keep your mind open for, you know, creative content. And um, then you won't feel like you're in some kind of like weird online sex, you know, rut or whatever, but yeah, it's a hard question to answer. Cause I, I really feel divided about the way things are going right now with censorship and call out culture. Like some of it's very important. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. But when some things are eradicated, you know we have to learn from some things you know when there's nothing there to like look that was wrong or whatever yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's a difficult question to answer properly and I, I don't know that there is the right answer and I just think perhaps it's something we have to be constantly asking ourselves and asking each other I I don't think call out culture is the answer I think that call out culture is incredibly violent and toxic and it's not something that I'm invested in I am invested in calling people in, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily calling people out. No, Ivory has a joke where she says, yeah, Ivory says that if, if never, if Dainty approaches you with fruit, then something's wrong. Because I, I, I really like to, you know, I, I was raised in the church. So I really like to hold, do the whole thing where let's go for some tea. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we have tea or, or coffee. And then, you know, I might pull out a, an apple or a banana or some oranges from my purse and be like, so I would like to talk to you <laughs> about an issue <laughs> that I'm concerned about. Um, I think that's a gentle way to either handle conflict or just call each other in to say, I love you. I'm concerned, or I love you. You hurt my feelings, or I love you. I don't agree with this, this, this post, those sorts of things. And so I, I do think that call out culture is actually quite violent and toxic. And I don't know that anybody deserves it, even the worst of us. I'm not saying that I'm going oh, to be with taking an orange. Care of... <laughs> what did you say? Sorry. I said soften the blow with an orange. Soften the blow <laughs> with an orange, with a fruit. <laughs> Pull something out of your purse and give the person something. Um, well, is there anybody else that would like to perhaps share your their thoughts on the question that I know I had I had tapped on on Tanya Cheek's shoulder, but if anyone would like to share their thoughts and feelings on fans only and is it appropriation? How does it feel to have something like that be co-opted or or and and the fallback that happens or maybe it doesn't matter because the rules have changed yet again and, and I do agree with you Tani I think that I don't know if it's if it's if it happens in cycles if it's there's a, some sort of a, a thing that happens where every 20 years or so we have to freak out because we remember that sex workers exist uh the satanic panic there's a thing that keeps happening where the culture it seems to me continually tries to move forward and evolve and then there are folks who are like no 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 that's too fast you know gay people can marry we we've got black people sitting at the front of the bus no 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 and then there's a revolt there's there seems to be a constant and pardon my pun here but there seems to be a constant push pull where hey. there are those there are i had to do a pun of of our own festival i'm so sorry people i had to do it i had to do it it's my dad joke um but there seems to be a constant tension in terms of those who want to evolve and move forward and those who are like, no, 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 your freedom will infringe my freedom. And so they say no to that. But is there anyone that would like to share anything about that before I ask another question? And then we move on to questions from our, our lovely audience. I know it's a complicated question. I, I don't think there is an easy answer, but I, I'm, I'm curious. Yes, Ivory. Um, I think it's complex because yeah. um, 
from a bird's eye view, it's frustrating. You watch a person who generally you would perceive as being privileged uh, and connected more than a lot of us independent artists, all of a sudden co-opting this um, art form and um, sort of uh, entrepreneurship that has before been underground and strictly reserved uh, to the community that has upheld it and has been persecuted for it. Mm -hmm. But just to be devil's advocate, and I hate doing this because I'm more on the, eh, it wasn't a good, good practice. If everybody had jumped on that bandwagon, if you saw Beyonce and Rihanna and Angelina Jolie all create fans only sites, Mm -hmm. How far would that pendulum swing in our favor to sort yeah. of shoot the censors and potentially give a voice that has more of a, a wider political platform to supporting the validity of sex work being real work? Mm. Well and said. that's the only thing where I go, in that scenario, maybe it could have been helpful and it's not just a person co-opting um you know a platform that has uh often been for um a more marginalized community um but potentially their money grab because that's what it looked like to a lot of us potentially it could have yeah. been helpful if it was a bunch of people from these levels of access or privilege doing this because maybe maybe <laughs> And then, this is just in a helpful world. Maybe that would have made it go mainstream that, hey, sex work is real work. We've been saying this from time. Absolutely. Let's get yeah. the fuck rid of Fosta Sesta and all these other chains that are making it impossible mm -hmm. to do sex work safely. Um, mm -hmm. And let's change, let's change the game. But that's just me being, you know, the cockeyed optimist. Uh, no, I... I... You know, I actually really appreciate that you said that, Ivory. You're, I, I love that you said that. I think that's quite, that's important to say. And again, it's a complicated question. We all know the devil doesn't need an advocate. He's fine. He's okay. He doesn't need help. But I, I think you're right. And that's a fair point to add, Ivory. You're right. In that, what if, you know, if the mainstream is doing it, then we can all do it. Then the culture has no choice but to be pushed forward and move forward. If it becomes mainstream, then the rules would have to change. You're right in saying that. And I really appreciate that. Thank you for that. I, I want to ask one more question before we open it up to our wonderful audience. And a quite, something I'm wondering about is the weaponizing of sexuality or weaponizing of your beauty, your body, like you're your product, right? You're selling yourself. People are constantly curious about yourself, which is why, again, I had to go to Ivory to get tips on how to do Instagram because I had no idea. But essentially, this is your product, right? And so you're you're constantly giving the an invisible wide audience, hopefully, um, an idea of who you are. You're letting them in and into your world. And I think that became even more so during our favorite P word, right? And so people get, the, you know, I, I posted a selfie. I, my, my apartment is like this big, right? It's just like a cute little shoe box. It's adorable. It's very tidy. And so when I take my selfies in my tiny apartment during lockdown, because we can't leave for those times, um, I have like one spot where I get good lighting, where the light hits and I'm like, okay, I look cute here. Here we go. And I, I, I had someone comment on, because in the picture they could see a rotary phone. I have a pink rotary phone, like 1950s style old phone. And the person had commented, they were like, does your phone work? Like really concerned. And I, I said, no, it, it doesn't. I, I got it at a yard sale or um, it doesn't work. And they, we ended up having a full on conversation. They were like, oh, well, you know, you could get it fixed. You know, you could get that to work if you wanted it. And I, it, it got me thinking about like how we're really able, even more so now to peer into someone's life, right? To sort of move, be, like look behind the velvet curtain, right? And I think that again, showgirls and performers have always been dealing in intimacy. 
intimacy is sort of our bread and butter. It's woven into what we do, right? And so even more so with the social media aspect of that, we're constantly showing we're exposing or revealing a part of ourselves always, right? Even if it's just a selfie in your apartment or at a coffee shop or um, photos showing your body or your beautiful self, showing yourself in costume or showing yourself performing, showing yourself at work, people are always looking and they're always seeing. Um, and so that makes you a content creator. It makes you just a creator, period. I saw there's a performer named Foxy Lexi She's based out of, uh, I think, Montreal. She's got cheekbones to die for. Like you, you could really just cut glass on this woman's cheekbone. Gorgeous woman, and her content is fabulous. Like I, she, she, I don't know how how she has the energy to do that. She just makes these incredible reels. I think they're called. And you go on. She did one the other day where she's dressed head to toe in red, and she was doing that song. Do you know that one, Bruno Mars, and whoever that guy is, because they formed a band now. She's dressed head to toe in red, and she's like, "What what you do when your monthly comes on?" And the song is like, <laughs> I, I'm not describing it properly. I. It gave me the laugh I needed that day. It really gave me the laugh. I was like, oh my God, she did that. Oh, I can't believe she did that. It was so funny. And so I'm thinking about like, does, does it feel as though you're, you're constantly using your femininity and your sensuality and your body as a weapon or as a tool or as an instrument? Is, is that, it, does it feel like that's sort of part of part and parcel of the business of being a performer, a showgirl, right? your social media, what you, how you show yourself, how you portray yourself, how much skin or how little skin you, you show. Does it feel that that's part of the work we do? And, and do you mind it? Do you mind using your body as a weapon or an instrument in terms of getting yourself more of an audience, more of a viewer, constantly being in dialogue with the people who like you, like your brand and like what you do? I'm going to ask Crocodile. I'm gonna tap your shoulder first and then I'm gonna tap Pearl, Pearl's shoulder after. Yeah, for me, I think definitely a tool, but a tool for my own liberation. Because oh my God, I'm so sorry. I had like I had like an emotional orgasm hearing you say that crocodile. That was a tool for your own liberation. Thank you. That was beautiful. Sorry, continue. Oh, no, you're okay. Thank you. <laughs> Each time I get to tell my story, the parts of me that get fragmented by oppression get integrated again. Mm. So as long as I'm mindful about what I'm sharing and why I'm sharing it, that it's equally for me and equally for the audience consumption, then I'm mm. good. But I have to also acknowledge that I'm, I'm saying this from a privileged standpoint where I have multiple streams of income so okay. when I choose to share on social media I'm not solely dependent on that medium for my income right yeah. right I love that thank you for sharing that crocodile pearl what are your thoughts to that sort of rambly question but yeah what are your thoughts I definitely feel that my body um, is an extension of my voice. Um, my body is a vessel for my own healing and an invitation to others to heal and define what healing means. And when I think of content, yes, there's definitely this intimacy, um, mm -hmm. which I celebrate. And anyone who's thinking about the power of content and sharing themselves, I invite you to create a mission statement um, that was one of the first things I did when I decided I'm a businesswoman and I'm going to be a burlesque queen with or without a crown. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you have your mission statement, it helps you stay in alignment with your values and who you want to be. And that will help you with your content. And the other thing that I always think about is not only do I have my mission statement and that's a guide for what I post and how much I share of myself, but I also mm -hmm. have my boundaries written down. So mm -hmm. I like to block and go. So anytime I feel that someone, the audience, the, someone on Instagram or wherever it is, gets a bit too personal and they try to get too close, even mm -hmm. if it's something that feels um, like kind, 
like with the person asking about your phone, you kind of have to toe the line because sometimes it's a soft step over the boundary line. Absolutely, yeah. And, and yeah. so you have to be very clear about mm-hmm. what your boundaries are, regardless if you're showing your body or not, whatever you share online yes. is a piece of you. So it doesn't matter if you're nude, if you're semi-nude, if you have a paper bag, over your head, it's still an extension of you and it's something that's still very sacred. So I I invite that, but I just want, you know, to also ask people to think about a mission statement and think about boundaries, actually writing them down so you know exactly, okay, this behavior doesn't sit well with me. And also just listen to your body Mm -hmm. when you're Mm -hmm. posting. Am I posting this to inspire myself? inspire others if it's business is this going to actually generate income is this for clients does this give the client potential client uh, a peek into what i can offer or is it just you know for ego in the a cheap thrill and cheap thrills are great but you have to honor that if that's what you want if you want cheap thrills then just honor that that's what you're getting so do you want mcdonald's or gumbo <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they're both, you know, you can have them both, but just, just honor that. So I don't feel like it's um, weaponizing. I, I wouldn't use that word for myself. Um, and I don't know that I, and I don't know that I believe any, any of our beautiful sex workers or showgirls online are, I think we're offering gifts to, to the audience and, and, but we have to have the boundaries. Hmm. Got to block and go. Block and go when they give you that eggplant. Block yeah. and go. I'm like, oh, there's an eggplant. Block and go. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, boundaries and knowing what your mission statement is, is is really important, even if it means you have to check in with yourself time and time again to see what your mission statement is. Ivory, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, for me, I naturally do a lot of self-talk in my daily life. And it's funny because my social media presence has become my own self-talk shared with the world. Um, And it's how I radiate authenticity across all mediums. Um, When I was a baby performer, um, I found that uh, I often felt silenced um, sort of on and off stage, if if I had an epiphany and I didn't get a chance to fully deliver it authentic, uh, authentically, if that makes sense, or if mm-hmm. I was being mediated or, or um, sort of molded by either a position I was forced to take or uh, the way that people wanted to perceive me. So controlling my image and um, my authentic self has been the most valuable resource for me in my brand um, and in myself as an individual. It, there, it's funny because this weird thing happened where Ivory, the artist, and Ivory, the person, just melded into one human who's 24-7, what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. It makes it a lot easier because there's no putting on one face and taking it off and putting on another one. This is just yeah. it, right? Um, And for me, uh, in terms of my traumas, in terms of um, the things that I've battled through my life, owning my truth has saved me from it. Um, Owning that I'm an assault survivor, owning my chronic pain, uh, owning my history and speaking loudly when in any other scenario, I likely would have shrank away. Uh, and I would have tried to hide it and it would have festered and caused all sorts of damage. Um, owning that, wearing it proudly and then self-talking for the world to see um, yeah. has been one of my best ways to utilize or weaponize my body, my sexuality uh, and my truth. Um, and it's What's helpful about that is when you live this vulnerably and you are this much of an open book, there's no need to go back and check your facts or your notes (laughs) because that's it. It's out there, right? Um, I'm very much like you, Pearl. If somebody oversteps that boundary, it's a block. I don't even engage anymore. And it's funny because 
I used to be, I'm a pugilist. I'm an Aries, Aries, Aries in every house but one. And in that one, I'm a Virgo. <laughs> so that's where the organization comes from. Uh, but I used to go to battle over everything on the internet because I had so much to say and so many feelings and people would tag me into petty fights. And I remember my grandmother, my revolutionary New York grandmother who grew up in the depression and uh, worked for Vogue back when, you know, Vogue magazine was everything and it was hard to even get pantyhose. She had to stand in line for hours. I digress. She always used to tell me, listen, you don't have to ride into every battle. Mm -hmm. And it drove me crazy as an outspoken, you know, little thing running around with all these fights. Um, it drove me crazy to say, I don't have to ride in it, into every battle. I was given this voice to speak. And then I realized sometimes your silence also speaks volumes. And sometimes, especially if it's your platform, especially if it's your social media or your fans only or whatnot, you have curated that feed for a reason. You also have the right to demand silence if it's a boundary line that somebody has crossed that's a hard line for you. And that's yeah. it. it it's all right to do that. You get to call those shots. And again, that sort of, for me, helps me utilize my body, my power, my presence and mm. live and work authentically. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that. I think it's really important to to con to recognize and know that it's okay to block and go like just having that freedom to know that I don't have to take care of somebody else's feelings if if somehow I hurt their feelings by existing it's not no. my job to do that it's not my job to do that at all I I really like I'm still circus, not my monkeys yeah yeah yes yes and yes Tanya what are your thoughts on that it, or, or how do you feel about any of that, any of what we, what has just been said. And then I would love to hear from our incredible audience. Please feel free to put in the chat.